42. I don't know if there were plans for children's church today or not. Praise God. Isaiah 42. We'll see what thus says the Lord to us. Verse number three. Isaiah 42, verse number three. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. Matthew 12 and 20, and stay there in the book of Isaiah 42. Matthew 12 and 20. Matthew 12 and 20. Praise God. Hallelujah. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench. Till he send forth judgment unto victory. Judgment unto victory. Let me read that again. Matthew 12 and 20. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. You may be seated. My message this morning is the inextinguishable fire. The inextinguishable fire. God is amazing. And in the beginning, God mentions in the book of Genesis that he made two great lights and that one would be considered the sun and the other would be considered the moon. And one was greater and one was lesser. And what we've come to find out is that as we continue to read on in Scripture in the New Testament, we would find that where there was light, that darkness comprehended it not. Darkness could not comprehend the light. And so John says in John 1, 5 through 9, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, which means that all of the satanic powers of darkness could never overcome the word because the word was light. And any time you see the word light and fire they are oftentimes used synonymous so when you see the daytime the daytime is only light because of its source the sun which is fire and so I want to talk about an inextinguishable fire and I want to bring to your awareness that there will be victory or there will be defeat. And victory or defeat will be determined by either advantage or disadvantage. By advantage or disadvantage. What I need you to understand is very, very important. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11... 
the Bible tells us that we must forgive. The reason the scripture starts talking about forgiving is because we have to work on ourselves. We have to make sure that there is nothing that is hanging over our head that will hinder the divine move of God concerning us. Amen. And so he starts off by saying, you have to forgive. Yes. You've got to free yourself from anything that you're holding against anybody. You must forgive. Yes. And so after he goes on and he gives us this hint that we need to forgive, he began to say the reason why we need to forgive. And he says, lest Satan, lest Satan get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, lest he gets an advantage. Let me talk a little bit about what we mean about advantage. According to Century Dictionary, gives us a very unique explanation, expository, if you will, of what advantage is. An advantage is the possession of a good vantage ground. It is vantage ground. And it is something that the enemy is always looking for in every individual's life. He is looking for vantage ground. And that means that if he gets ground, it's for the attainment of his ulterior objectives or desires. And so what Satan does is he goes into what we call gatherings. And according to Isaiah 54 and 15, he says, Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. These forces that come against individuals in the body of Christ, they gather. And they gather with what I call a stratagem, not so much strategy. It's what we call a stratagem. And a stratagem is a plan. It's a scheme. It's a trick. It comes to surprise and it comes to deceive and so the enemy meets, according to Isaiah 54 and 15, to bring forth his stratagem. But I want to tell you something. There are four things that the enemy is now focused on. And you got to now begin to work out your own soul salvation with fear and with trembling. You have to now be so concerned about your own life, about your own destiny, about the course of life that God has picked for you. Because God has ordained for you to have a specific kind of life. And the life that God has ordained for your life was supposed to be a good life. God intended for you to have a successful life. There are four Greek words, three Greek words that we use for life. The first Greek word we use for life is bios. And bios means physical life. B-I-O-S in the Greek. It means a physical life. God wanted you to be enriched in a good physical life. It's where we get the English word uh, biology from the Greek word bios. The next word that represents life in the Greek is psyche. And psyche is soul life. And soul life deals with the, the mind, the emotion, and the will. In other words, God intended you to have sound mind. Soundness in mind, wherein you're starting to make good decisions. You're making wise and prudent choices. And so the word psyche in the Greek means soul life. It is the psychological life of the human soul. 
where we get the English word psychology. I want you to understand that there is a Zoe life, the Zoe life, number three. First life is bios, physical life. Second life is psyche, soul life. The third life is Zoe, eternal life. It is divine life uniquely possessed by God and shared with the believer. And that's why the Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, that God expects for us to have a life and then that life abundantly. And in that abundance, it encompasses a great or a high level of happiness, a high level of success, a high level of elevations throughout your life and promotions. And this is the will of God, that God wanted you to have a life of peace. God wanted you to have a life of good relationships. Not all this broken stuff. Not every time you turn around, your heart is broken and you are disappointed and sad. This is not the life that God expected for us to have. God wanted us to have the bios life, a good physical life, a psyche life, a good soul life, in our mind, emotion, and will, and the Zoe life, which is the eternal life of God that we will carry within our spirit forever. When we step into forever, we will step into the Zoe life of God. And there is power in the Zoe life of God. But we're talking about an inextinguishable fire. What we are learning is that Satan is playing on us. He is playing on our mental state. And he comes to bring four strategies. And there are tools that he uses to ensure that we don't have a bios life, that we don't have a psyche life, and that we don't tap into the Zoe life. And in order to do that, he has to launch an attack on our fire because it is the fire of God that does so many things. Number one, it identifies us with God's power. In this earth, we are the salt of the earth or we are the light of the earth. That word light also means fire. We are the fire that is in this earth. And guess what? The darkness has comprehended it not. Darkness doesn't understand how come it cannot trump and triumph over the light or over the fire. It's because it has been prophesied in the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and God began to say a smoldering flax will he not quench. So there are four things that Satan wants to use as a strategy against your life. You have, been, you have come here today to hear this because this is something that God wants you to know. Number one, the enemy is always playing on your ignorance. He plays on what you don't know. If you are uninformed, ill-informed, or misinformed, there is a level of ignorance that Satan expects from the believers. He expects there to be secrets and things in the realm of the spirit that we don't take the time out to tap into and to learn. First Lady said something really profound to me the other day. And she said, what is it? And it's the question that I have been asking for years. What is it that some of these folks have done in scripture that has tapped into all kinds of wonders in God? What did Paul know where he can go to Miletia and put his hand in some wood, get bit by a venomous snake, and just shake it off. 
where everybody was expecting to see the swelling, he was able to just shake it off. When he was preaching a long time and a man got tired because of the length or the longevity of his preaching, a man went to sleep and fell out the window, broke his neck and died. Paul stopped preaching, went outside and went up to the man and raised him back to life again. What did Paul know? What is the secret? What did he know? Wherein he was able to manifest such great presence and power. It's because there was a fire in him. And he understood how to navigate that fire. He understood how to keep that fire burning and never let that fire go out. And here's where I need to encourage you this morning. You have to fight now to make sure that your fire never goes out. There is a passion that has been impregnated in your spirit. There is a volition and there is a drive that's in your spirit. Don't let anything deter you from your passion. Don't let anything stop you from writing that book. Don't let anything stop you from starting that business. Don't let anything stop you from going back to school. Don't let anything stop you from bettering yourself and self-improvement and losing weight and getting in shape and thinking about dietary issues. Don't let anything stop you from being on fire. Why? Because God has put an inextinguishable fire on the inside of you. And all Satan could do is hope that his stratagem works against you. And so the first thing he tries is to play on your ignorance. The second thing he does is to blind you through distraction. The Bible says Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of them that would believe. One of the things that Satan has done to blind the minds of people that would believe, he has distracted them on a quest for income. Listen to me very carefully. There has been a demonic distraction for a quest for income. I'll say it again. There is a great demonic distraction to those who are on a quest for income. Let me tell you something. Never compromise your worship or your worship time. Never compromise again your worship or your worship time. And what the enemy has done, he has blinded us to truth. And there is a truth that God will supply your needs. He was called Jehovah Jireh. That means that God will supply for himself. And because he's Jehovah Jireh and he supplies for himself, he will supply for you. Stop trying to work three jobs to survive. This is not what God wanted you to do. God wanted you to have a job, but yet God wanted you to have work. And you got to have a job, but then you have work, which is a corresponding action to your job. We've got to work for God, and we've got to learn how to put God first and not be distracted by the struggle for income because I serve a God who can work between midnight and morning. I serve a God who can give you more than enough. I serve a God that can move you up the ladder through elevation and take you from not enough to enough to more than enough. I serve a God that desires that you take out time with your children. You take out time with your husband or your wife. You take out time with your family. God never wanted you to be obsessed with income. Because he always takes care of his people. I want to let you know too. I heard this in the spirit. And I said it the other night. 
God has sent angels and they are now blowing on the credit bureau. Some of that junk that's been on your report is about to come off. I heard the Holy Ghost say, I'm going to delete it. I saw deletion on your credit report. These are some of the things that's been hindering us from doing some of the stuff that we needed to do. And we allowed that to close doors on us. But I want you to know your credit standing status is about to change. God said your credit is about to change. I wish somebody would have shouted and caught on fire. Oh, it's about to change. Stuff that credit was used to close the door on you. It's going to be used to open the door on you. Do you believe that? We cannot be deceived by a chasing income. Because I want to let you know, if you are obedient to God, you can live on two things. Number one, a blessing because of obedience. Or you could live on a principle that's been applied. I want to teach you something deep on the deep things of God about income. If the Lord puts his blessing on you, you will never have to worry about income again because God will keep things incoming. God will keep finances incoming. God will keep a blessing incoming and you don't know how God is going to do it but you need to stop for one moment and stop trying to figure out the mind of God for the Bible says who can know the mind of God as a seed that goes in the ground I don't know what happens once it's covered by dirt but one thing I know scientifically, there's a process called germination. And I don't know all that's involved in germination, but I know that's not my responsibility. But when a seed goes in the ground and that seed gets watered, hallelujah, after a while, there's a set time that seed is going to come up the bible says first the blade the blade is evident that the seed is life first the blade then the ear then the full corn in the ear i said income is going to keep coming god knows what you need yes So we've been fooled by income because we're chasing it and it should be chasing you. So when you tithe, when you live for God, when you do righteously, when you obey God, you are tied in to the blessing of Abraham. And so God will bless you through a blessing. Sometime God decides, I just want to do it through a principle. And here comes Isaac to a dry land. There is nothing going on in that land. It's called Gerar. He goes to Gerar at a time where it's like desert. That's the time that God really wants to move. God likes moving when things seem impossible. Because God wants you to know I got a hand in this. I have a hand in this. And so I wait till it looks impossible. How can I buy a house this year? When I looked at my income and when I looked at my credit, when I looked at my checking and my savings account, things began to look dry. But that's the time when God does his best work. God loves working in dryness. And Jesus himself came out of dryness. The Bible said that Jesus, 
He was a root that came out of a dry ground. Hallelujah. Do you know that's true? So Isaac says, I have all these seeds and I got to find a place to plant it. So I'm going to go to Gerar because that's where it's dry. And that's where God will prove himself. So he applied a principle. And the principle is you reap what you have sown. See, you got a lot of folks looking for stuff. And they haven't reaped anything. They haven't applied any principle. So he applies the principle. He goes to a dry ground and he begins to dig a hole in the dry ground. The Bible said he begins to plant in the dry ground. And within one year, the Bible said the seeds in the dry ground sprouted. And they sprouted so to the king of the region says that you need to move out of this region. Because he was jealous. Because he had been planting on fertilized ground. And he never received what Isaac received because God bless the principle. This is why we tell you to sow in the house of God because it's a principle. And if you begin to apply the principle, God will somehow bless you. Somebody will call you and say, hey, we need you. We are paying $20 an hour more. I want you to know this is your time that God's about to elevate you but you can't be blinded by chasing income let God be God and let God help you along the way but you got to humble yourself and you got to say Lord I'm in a situation where I need your help and I know that you can give me increase at any moment if I trust you, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to sell out. But I know the God whom I believed and the God who I've trusted. He is able to do anything but fail. Clap your hands and shout amen. So we get blinded with distraction. We're doing all of this stuff to make money and we're now seeking the cares of this world and it now begins to choke the fire out of us it begins to slowly extinguish the fire because we are more and more separated from the presence of God so we're looking for incomes and there's so many people that's been telling me, I'm sorry, pastor, I can't come to church services anymore because I work on Sunday. And I have a problem with that. And here's the problem. There's no problem with you having to work Sunday afternoon. But any time you cut an agreement that every Sunday morning I would be somewhere else because I'm chasing income, we have not allowed ourselves to trust God. There are jobs out there that would have paid you much more if you would have turned that one down. I tell people, don't ever settle. Anytime you go to an interview, can I teach you something? Trust you me. I've been in banking and so forth and so on. I was a hiring manager. I did it all. But I do want to tell you, Anytime you apply for a job and they're offering you $20 an hour or whatever it is, you always have leverage to ask for more. And they come into the interview knowing they have the leverage, but they know you don't know, going back to number one, ignorance. So I'm revealing something to you. You could tell them, well, I really need 25 or 30. I'm really looking at, and all my other offers were between da-da-da and da-da-da. And they will start negotiating with you in faith because God is giving you the wisdom 
And now you're not chasing income. You're relying on the wisdom of God to speak for you. And that's why the Bible said, let wisdom or let patience have a perfect work. Because she will work for you if you just be a little patient. You don't have to take everything they're offering you. You don't have to take the first thing that they're offering you. And so Satan is relying on us to begin to chase income and not God. Are you hearing me? I cannot tell you in my lifetime how many jobs, how many jobs I was offered on Sunday morning. And they were paying $85,000 a year. It would have been making a hundred in no time. I turned it down. I turned it down. I turned it down. I refused to do it. And I still make over $100,000 a year. But I refused to settle because I knew it was a deception from the devil. I knew the enemy was using a stratagem. It was a plan to get me from worshiping, to get me from getting close to God, to, from getting me from serving God. And so that was part of his plan. I'm almost done. So the first thing he does is plays on our ignorance. The second thing he does is he attempts to blind us through distraction. And within that distraction, I wanted to specifically mention when we are chasing income, the enemy will get involved. Be very careful with that. Be very careful with that. Hallelujah. Number three, to weaken you by sin. Satan wants to sting you. And to weaken you by some kind of sin. Because he knows that when there is some kind of sin, it has efficacy on the fire of God. Because God is holy and God is righteous. And so we have to defend the fire of God. And we have to not allow ourselves to be weakened by sin. Now's the time where you need to be strong. And I want to tell you something. Be strong because Satan expects you to be weak so he could deceive you with the wrong man. So many folks are getting the wrong partner in this time and we've been deceived because we're weak. I can't wait for my Mr. Right. So I get Mr. Now and whoever comes now and whoever is available, you got to learn patience and you got to let patience work for you. You can't be deceived anymore. You can't be fooled anymore with nonsense because ain't nobody got the time for these games anymore. We don't have time for foolishness. We don't have time for nonsense. You done told the last lady the same lie and then you told the one before that the same lie and you done lied to the other one. I ain't got time for this. I'm trying to get myself together. I'm trying to get my family together I'm trying to watch out for my kids I'm trying to provide a good life and I don't have time to spin my wheels over and over again hallelujah so don't be weakened by sin fine has got a lot of people in trouble he fine she's fine She's fine has got a lot of us in trouble looking for fine, hooking up with fine, because what happens after fine? What happens after good looks? What happens after 20 minutes of fun and thrill? It could be AIDS. It could be herpes. It could be some life altering something going on hallelujah it could be a baby thank you jesus but all kinds of things can happen when the enemy attempts to weaken us stop talking about how weak you are stop talking about how bad things are stop focusing on that let the weak say i'm strong Tell your headache your head don't hurt no more. Your headache got a healed ache and God has healed it. 
tell your body you don't hurt no more. That God has healed me. Everybody at some point got stomach problems. I'm talking to somebody out here. Everybody at some time has stomach problems. How many of you know that's true? But Paul told Timothy, drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. You know what he was trying to say? That there's an answer to every problem. There's a cure to every sickness. How many of you know that's true? God always has an answer. So don't you give in to weakness. Because God's got your back. And God knows what's best for you. Don't buy the car because it looks enticing. It's going to lead you to debt. And you're going to figure out once you get in the finance office that that $2.99 a month went to $6.99. Well, we had to add on this and you forgot about that. Then we had to add on interest. And then we had to have on a plan, a maintenance plan. So now you're sitting there all day long, thought this was the car of your dreams. And you found out you couldn't afford it. But you thought since it was approved, I'll drive out anyway. How many of you know the devil has a way to blind you to truth and use you and take advantage of you when you're weak? Are you hearing me? The last thing the enemy does in his fourfold stratagem is to attempt to extinguish your fire. See, what I want you to know is that Satan has spies. I'm about to preach now. I got five minutes. I want you to know that Satan has spies. And those spies are watching you. And I want you to know that those spies have identified with the actors and the actresses. And the devil is watching very carefully Monday through Saturday. He is watching through spies your life. So it's hard to fool him on Sunday. Because he knows everything that's been happening from Monday to Saturday. And he's got what I call spies. Somebody says the devil got spies. Say it. Well, Hezekiah, in Isaiah 42, he made a big mistake. He thought because of his arrogance and how God has blessed him being king of Judah, that he would kind of grandstand. And he wanted to show off a little bit. And now he's in the area of pride. He wanted to show off all of the splendor, the treasures, the gold. Let me tell you something. There are some things that God showed you, you better not tell nobody. There are some secrets you better not share. There's some things you know that God told you, they're for you. And you better keep them to yourself. Because some of us have been destroyed because we told a spy something. That we never should have said. But there are spies in disguises. And now Hezekiah is confronted with spies. He thinks that he has admirers. Sometimes we think that people will come into our life. And they are our admirers. There's something about you they genuinely like. And they lead you to believe that. They are your admirers. They will make you feel as though you're all that and some. They will encourage you. They will tell you how beautiful you are, how handsome you are, and how wonderful you are. But deep down inside, they're only a spy and they're seeking information. This is why we tell young ladies, don't tell a man everything about you the first night that he meets you hallelujah and we say vice versa 
Don't sit here telling that woman everything about you. The first night that she met you, he already knows you live alone. He already knows you live by yourself because you made it known. It's just me and I live by myself. Oh, that spy is calculated. Mm-hmm. There's a place where her and I could be together alone. So let's see if we could fish for some more information. And the spy is going on and where you from and how many kids do you have and, and, and all kinds of information. The spy is gathering information. Well, what happened as I close this message today in the book of Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah was unaware that he had some spies that were all around him. And one of the spies was the son of Baladon. And Baladon's father was king at the time of the enemy camp. But Hezekiah was king of Judah. But Hezekiah began to brag. And he began to say, look at all this stuff. Let me tell you something. Something's gonna happen to you because your fire is about to turn into a flame but stay humble because God's going to bless you others around you are going to wonder how is it that every time I turn around God is doing it again and again and again and again he keeps on doing it over again and I thank him for my victories one after another yeah let me close I gotta get out of here and so there's spies all around Hezekiah Hezekiah think that these are admirers Hezekiah think these are his friends you got to be careful what you share with whom. Are you hearing me? Stop sharing your precious jewels. Y'all look at it, maybe crazy. Y'all stop giving away that cookie. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You got a spy trying to get your cookie. You got a spy trying to get what's valuable to you. You got a spy that's trying to take what you built up. Oh, hallelujah. It's a spy. We got to watch these spies. The Bible says in my closing something very interesting. It says that Hezekiah showed the enemy all that Israel had. Showed him the gold. Showed him the silver. Showed him the safe. Showed him the precious stuff. And the enemy turned around and came up with an idea. Thank you, idiot, for showing me all this. Thank you, idiot, for telling me all this. Thank you, idiot. Hallelujah. I want you to know when you tell a little too much, the devil will use it against you. Stop telling your husband too much. Stop telling your wife too much. Stop telling your significant other a little too much. One day, they'll use it against you. Everything you said, they'll use it against you to tear you down. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? Hey, I feel the power of God. Babylon said, now that we know all that he has, now that we know where it is, the spy says, we coming to get it. We coming to get it. Let me tell you something. You hold fast your testimony, what you tell in church that God has done for you. When you say the Lord has blessed me and the Lord is this and the Lord has that, make sure you boast it in the Lord. Because you got a few spies that have been listening. 
and they're coming in a gathering with a plan to see how they can take your fire. Are you with me? And so the prophet comes and he says to Hezekiah, he said, the Lord sent me to come talk to you for some reason. Have you been showing all of what Israel has? Have you been bragging about our wealth and materialism? He said, yes, I showed it to the former king. I, I showed it to the enemy and I told him everything that we have. And he said that was one of the biggest mistakes. Isaiah said, the prophet said, that was the biggest mistake that you made. Because now God says that Babylon is coming for you. And Babylon is going to take everything that you bragged about. And everything that you showed him. They were not your friends, but they were spies. And they were trying to figure out how to take everything you got. I want you to know this morning that there are demonic spies. They are trying to figure out everything you got. Be careful when somebody new comes in your life. You better discern. Are you a spy? You better be careful when somebody tries just to help you are you helping me because you're a good Samaritan or are you helping me because you're a spy are you helping me because you're a good guy or are you helping me because you want my cookie oh he says everything that you have is about to go into Babylon and Babylon is going to take everything. I don't even know why Hezekiah prayed and asked God to add 15 more years to his life. He was a fool right after 15 years. I don't know why he even bothered asking God to leave him around because all he did was stupid things and foolish things be careful for what you are doing there's a spy that's coming after you yes but then Isaiah says when the spy comes always know if you're rooted if you're grounded in God if your faith if your confidence is in God the Bible says, uh, I need you to know uh, a smothering, a smothering fire will not go out. It's inquenchable. I want you to know uh, as long, as long as you can identify what the enemy is doing, God is going to bless you and your fire will never go out. God is ready now to set you on fire anybody want to be on fire anybody stand to your feet i'm done i'm done